talking to our amazing guest this is the closest we're going to get to to like the oscars in south africa so it's a huge privilege to, to have uh um Tabi with us but i unfortunately have to leave and go off to a meeting because i still do a little bit of work um and i can't always be available for these sessions so i just really wanted to say hello to everyone and this is our second on stage, starting to gain a little bit of uh, momentum. Uh, I think we still are facing some challenges in terms of, you know, connectivity and bringing people. I'm hoping that this is going to be a regular place for our grade 10s and 11s. Uh, I think we all understand that the grade 12s are under enormous pressure and mm -hmm. that I think the online stage, the public speaking and the performances are going to be better suited to the kids who aren't feeling the same pressure. So I hope you all have a good session. I might get back in uh, to join you, but I have to go off and meet uh, Mnet, my client. And I just wanted to wish you all well. So I'll see you guys later. Have a good session. I'm handing over back to your hosts, uh, Sam and Sonolo. Have a good session, guys. Goodbye. Thank you. All right, Cliff. Hi. So yes, everyone, Hi. welcome. Hi. And welcome to our Thoughtful Thursday webinars. And as Clifford said, this is our second of our online stage sessions. And um, I think he, he introduced our amazing new guest, our first guest. Um, but I want to actually say from my perspective, um, thank goodness it is Women's Month and that's why it's also perfect to have her. She is extremely talented in all areas as a performer, a writer, director, producer, theater maker, filmmaker, she is a strong, beautiful, phenomenal, inspiring woman. And her name is Retabili Matobi. So welcome, Retabili. Thank you, Sam. We are so amped to have you here, really. Um, and I just want to say, you know, obviously looking at your CV, your credits are endless. <laughs> and I think sometimes if you ever hear someone reading through your credits as they're introdu introducing you, there could be a moment where you actually suddenly go, are they talking about me? Oh, you know definitely. what I mean? Have you ever had that experience? And I actually want to say, you know, if you ever take a moment just to stop and think back over your journey, can you believe where you're at now and what you've achieved? No. <laughs> I, also think, <laughs> I also think it's that thing of, you don't, you know, we don't see ourselves. It takes someone else looking at you and saying, Hey, listen, I'm just holding up a mirror to say, this is, this is who you are. Um, so it's moments like this where I have people like you and friends and family that just speak back saying, hey girl, this is you. Hello, Mira. And you go, oh, whoa, look at that. Apparently I did do that. It's amazing. It's almost like you just take one step and one step and the next right step and the next right step. And if you do happen to turn around, you can't believe it yourself. And I think that's also how one should sort of approach goals and see, you know, these big, seemingly unattainable goals. And actually along the way, there's so many, many victories along the way. So the journey as well, when you actually talk about people's achievements, you don't often talk about the hardships. You mm. don't often talk about the minor back steps or the sideways steps or, you know, the many fails that you might have had or per perceived failures that you might have had. No one actually sees that. So we wanted to take you right back to the beginning. So we wanted to know who Rita Bili was as a child. <laughs> okay, uh, how far back? Baby, from when you <laughs> popped out the room. Go. <laughs> Wowzers, wow, wow, wow. Um, so I guess, am I correct in saying that this um, chat, this platform, it's we're focusing on arts as well, so it's also the creative? That's it, that's okay, it. Okay, great, so I know Sam, you've heard this story before, so you're gonna have you to- You go mad. I love your stories. <laughs> um, so my parents actually got me into all things theater and creative when I was around three years old. Um, and so I had three siblings. I have an older sister who's about seven years older than me. And I had a younger brother who passed away. Um, but all three of us, when we were really young, 
um, were signed up with a modeling agency. Back then it was Bodine's modeling, acting and modeling kids agency. And so from the time I was three years old, I was learning how to attend auditions, how to learn lines, how to model and look cute. At some point I was the face of macro kids. Um, and so I did that for a while. And then when I turned five, I got fired uh, because <laughs> Your girl became a diva. And so with kids, obviously we were paid money, um, which went to my parents because children don't understand the value of money. And so back then, I don't know what they do now, but back then they would um, encourage us with chocolate. So they'd be like, okay, Rotavile, we're gonna do this. And when you're done, you're gonna get your chocolate bunny. And I'd be like, yay. And you'd go ahead and you'd do the thing. And then afterwards you'd get your chocolate bunny. But obviously, the more I did these auditions, the more I went through this process, I realized that actually I have a lot of power. Um, even at the age of four and five, I realized that. Well, I was like, okay, well, listen, if I don't do these lines and if I don't do what they say to me, then we can't leave. And so I started demanding my chocolates up front um, and saying, well, I'm not going to do it until you give me my chocolate first. Um, Needless to say, that didn't last long and I got fired um, at the age of five. Um, and after a three year break, my parents thought it was time for, to take me back. And so at eight years old, um, I got signed up again and I started doing it again. And that's where I really started to see the industry because I was old enough now to actually notice um, what was happening. And so I did a lot of like adverts, KTV ads, BP, um, LP gas, I'm trying to remember all the random things I did, but I started doing it and I'd get to leave school, which I loved, um, to go shoot. So I did that from eight till 14 and then high school happened and then my parents were like, that's great, my girl, you've, you know, you've had your time to play, but now it's high school, so you've got to be serious because this drama thing, you can't do this drama thing for life, you know, you've got to go become a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant, um, said the girl with parents who were is a doctor and a lawyer and has a, an accountant for an assistant. Um, and so high school happened and I wasn't allowed to do it anymore, but I was lucky enough to have a school that had after drama programs in primary school and then high school drama was offered as a subject at my school. And I guess my teachers were just the most encouraging people, whether they were the drama teachers or just my other teachers, uh, they, um, really took the time to see that, okay, listen, you're gifted in this area, you're gifted in speaking. So the one teacher then drafted me into the uh, impromptu public speaking um, after school activity. And another teacher was like, well, um, you're, she was an Afrikaans teacher, uh, Dario Deneda, he taught Afrikaans. Uh, but he, at some point, I think he'd studied drama earlier. And so I landed up doing Afrikaans because he made Afrikaans fun and he taught Afrikaans with drama principles. And so in Afrikaans, we were writing stories and writing plays in Afrikaans that we'd get to perform and radio dramas. And that encouraged me in my writing. Um, and then Karen Diabru, who, or oh, Mrs. Diabru back then, I guess. Um, she was my drama teacher and she just really encouraged me in my directing and performing um, and broke a lot of the rules that existed in the school that said, you know, you're not allowed to direct until you're in matric. And she's like, but if you're good, you're good. And if you're ready, you're ready. It doesn't matter how old you are. Um, if your story is written well and you've put the work in and it's good enough to, you know, be presented, then it's your turn. And so she encouraged me that way and got me writing uh, one one act plays that were then part of the Raps Festival, um, which I'm not sure they don't exist anymore, which is heartbreaking. Wow. You are um, incredible. You are incredible because basically this all then came from not really any formalized training. This is basically based, right? I mean, did you have any proper acting training, any performance arts training, or did you learn on the job? So, learned on the job and then varsity after a while. Yes. Um, because I had all these, like, all these teachers who encouraged me and I'd done all these things and written these plays and won awards in high school. Um, they basically peer pressured my parents into making me study drama because it's what I wanted, but obviously black parents, you know, drama king, <laughs> how are you gonna pay bills with drama? What's this, this play play thing you're doing? Um, but again, yeah. because I had the support of my teachers, I got to go study. And that is the power of brilliant mentors and educators. Correct. Olo is actually yeah. a teacher. So I know he has something to ask you about that as well. He's a teacher mm. himself and was a passionate. Yeah. I'm interested. I mean, it sounds like you've been in the industry forever, you know. 
So being in the industry from such a young age, I mean, I'm interested. Like, there are definitely pros and cons of being in the industry at such a young age. You know, can you share mm-hmm. some of the pros, some of the cons with us? You know, from your side, I can, I can already get a feeling that you had good support system in terms of your teachers and all of that. But can you just mm-hmm. share with us the pros and cons of being in the industry from such a, an early age? Sure. So in terms of pros, I always go say, let's start with the positive Um, support system. I had an amazing support system. I had my parents who were initially very encouraging and then at some point not encouraging and then found their way back to being encouraging again. Um, I had my teachers who, again, were always willing to just put themselves out there and go the extra mile. And when my parents couldn't fetch me from a late night drama rehearsal, they'd be like, listen, we want her in this. We know you said you don't have the capacity, so we will drive her home, even though they lived in Sants and I live all the way in Midrand and it's definitely out of their way. But there I had teachers give me lifts home. Um, also, I guess just seeing the inside of the machine again from such a young age um, just really expanded my view on what could exist because I wasn't just acting. I could see that they were camera people. They were like admin people. Not that I knew the word admin at that age, but they were people with papers doing things. So I might not have known the words of what they were doing, but I knew that there was more than just this acting thing um, or writing. So that was definitely a pro. Um, in terms of cons, Obviously, in terms of juggling school and a career, because at some point it was a career at a young age from eight years old, was interesting. Having to leave school early is exciting, but that doesn't stop teachers from asking you for your homework. And they don't care that you decided to leave. So that's, you know, that's on you. Um, And then I guess also when you're young and you're thrust into the industry and you're working, it, it also forces a level of maturity onto you, possibly maybe too early. Um, And so like the fact that then I started throwing tantrums. I started, I got a bit of an ego. Um, you know, I'm working <laughs> this is my money. It wasn't, it was, but it wasn't my parents. Put that money away for school. So I didn't actually touch that money, but you know what I mean? So there were cons in that way as well. Did your friends support you? Oh, well, friends think it's cool. Friends like, there's my friend on the KTV ad. Like, <laughs> yes. Amazing. Friends, so there was no jealousy. Dope. No jealousy at that age. There was nobody trying to say, who do you think you are? And nothing. If, if there was, I was definitely you know. protected or just wasn't aware of that. Um, it's definitely been a grace on my life that way. Um, just the right people just in my life, just being able to protect me and keep me on track. Awesome. Oh, beautiful. And then here's a fascinating thing for me, uh, Ritavilla. Uh, Sam mentioned I'm a teacher, but I'm also a writer. You know, okay. so... <laughs> I understand you do quite a, a variety of things within the creative space. Um, mm. That's quite interesting, but I'm sure that's difficult. Why not stick to one thing? Let's say, why not stick to your modeling and, and whatever that you did from when you were a kid? You know, why don't you just stick to writing poetry or just producing films or theater? Why do so many things at one time? I mean, that's insane. It must be crazy. Uh, it can be. <laughs> it can be, but I think it's a number of things. Um, So my thinking is if you're gifted in multiple things, why limit yourself? Uh, Why only do one? Obviously take the time to hone them each separately so that you do, you're you're like, you're not a, you know, jack of all trades and master of none. So obviously take the time to work on all of them. Um, But also because I made the active choice of saying that I will always be in the creative industry. um, You need to, the industry has its ups and downs. So example now during COVID, A lot of performers haven't necessarily been acting. There's not as much work as there was before. There isn't. So you need to have other skills that you can do. So I know a lot of actors also teach um, or give workshops. I know some writers, well, yes, they can write their films or their plays, but they'll also do copywriting for ads or write somewhere else, do you know what I mean, for corporate. So you need to just have so many different things in your toolbox to help you survive the many different seasons that are gonna come because I know TV and film makes the creative industry look very glamorous. And I guess it can be sometimes, <laughs> but really that glamour is like a fraction, a percentage of the hard work and that goes into making what you see in the end. It's almost like when you have a vision as well, you know, you have a vision of something and, and maybe the start of it is a story that you wanna tell but then 
all those other aspects help you to realize that story visually, mm. creatively, mm. you know, so you're absolutely right. It all links up, you know, you never just see sort of one art form as completely separate from the others. And, and like you say, we're very lucky in this country actually to be able to be versatile because yeah. I know overseas, like if you're a musical theater performer, that's all you do. If you are mm. a straight actor, that's all you do. So I think that, you know, it's incredible that we're actually are gifted with that. I'm mm. interested to know your first writings when you were writing one act plays and stuff for school, like what were the themes that you were writing about? Um, so I've always been interested in identity. Uh, I guess the idea of, so I was born, I'm going to give away my age. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> child of the 80s right so meaning so i was alive for like what the last bits of apartheid and i can kind of remember some things but definitely remember the transition from 94 coming through and then when white schools or formerly white schools opened up for black kids being part of the first few black kids to be in those spaces so you know you're in the space of privilege where you're seeing a lot of white faces maybe not necessarily a lot of black faces that look like yours um so your English is getting better and that's where like my English improved and my accent changed, whatever, these Model C schools. But then you go home or you go to your grandmother's at school holidays and you're with your cousins who now, you know, talk to you about like, why do you sound white? And but so at school, you're too black for the white kids. But then sometimes you go home and then you're too white for your black family. And it's a strange place of like privilege um, to sit in. And it was definitely just something I struggled with for a very long time. And so I started writing poetry around that in school and then eventually started writing plays um, around just looking at identity. And eventually from looking at self-identity, it moved on to looking at just like culture as a whole. So I'm a Sutta woman, but what does that mean? What does my Sutta culture mean? Like I don't, I, I barely go to Lesotho, we go sometimes, but you know what I mean? And so I started, the first big one act play I wrote, um, actually the second, um, was I spent time in Lesotho, I researched um, and then just wrote a one act play on my culture and a cultural practice known as Shubediso, which um, some people may or may not know. Some people might classify it as human trafficking, um, mm. actually, but it is a cultural practice that takes place. And so I learned about that. I met real women, it happened to, um, interviewed them, and from there wrote a fictional story that became the one act play that we put on at Raps. So. Oh. Awesome, Ritabila. I must say, I've lived in Lesotho. So hearing you talk like that about my culture excites me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you when it comes to that. And then I, I think I was also, I, I just wanted to add also a question, just your writing process. So now from what you say, already, I can hear you talk about the research that you do before, you know, you just sit and write something, which is, mm. I feel like in most cases, we see the finished uh, product. We don't get to see the hard work that goes into that. Can you just walk us through that? Well, I know you've already started uh, telling us about it, but can you just walk us through, you know, the writing process? Sure. Um, so I do think everybody has their own process um, and it's about finding what works for you. I know oftentimes for me, I need to just inundate my brain with research. I'm also, I'm a nerd. I love books. I've always loved books. Um, and so whenever I've been tasked with writing something or even the simple thing of writing like a Women's Day poem, let's just go with that as an example. I know that the first thing I'll do is I will sit on the internet and find books on femicide, GBV, women's issues, and I just need to flood my brain with all this information and I'll research and I'll read and I'll highlight and I'll staple. And then I'll let it go because it's in my brain. I've read it, I've read it maybe for the past like a week or two weeks and then have a week of breathing room where there's just nothing. But I know that what I've read is somewhere inside me now. Like there's a knowledge of it. I might not remember it perfectly, but there is a knowledge, there is a knowing, there is a growing that's happened in that moment. And then after that period, then I'll start writing and deciding, well, where am I gonna begin or whatever seed or spark exists in my brain. Um, then I'd start the writing process and knowing that I think many times we always forget and I know it's something I used to forget in school all the time is that writing is rewriting. So the first time you write something, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, it's done. 
now fam <laughs> it's not done <laughs> that be take one <laughs> and you're gonna have to rewrite and look at it and go again and see like okay great well maybe my subject matter is great but maybe the structure i've used isn't working to help get this information across to the people properly or maybe my structure is great but my subject matter isn't quite working or the way the words i've used or questioning so again it's just it's a process and you have to find your own process um, yeah, but I do believe in research, 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 because you don't know everything. I do hope we have some of the learners here because I think this is wonderful information that you're giving us and the guys have to do either a speech or a performance piece. So I'm hoping they, they are sort of like picking up points of what to do and what not to do. You know, just finding that process, whether it's writing process or, you know, taking a film, whatever, you know, stuff. I hope you guys are taking notes. Yeah, it's also like, the I love the idea when you, when you put it that way about, you know, um, the first draft, the second draft, the third draft, and sometimes what you end up with is never what you started with. Mm. It's got the seeds of it, but it changes. So there's like so many elements to that. First of all, is like, is um, not being so um, ego attached to a process and, and allowing it to unfold. And even if you are showing it to people to be open to, especially people you trust, open to um, notes direction help especially from mentors and and going mm. back to the drawing board and carrying on working and to realize also that there is no failure you know each fall right. is almost like the first step of success because you know it's going to take you to the next place so it requires like a real interested kind of curiosity to to learn and to grow and and i think that is huge in terms of what the creative arts actually teaches kids and that's yeah. why I love it, teaching the expressive arts to kids. What do you feel? Ahmed, drama is more than just acting and writing. Um, if I had my way, I'd say that everybody, regardless of what industry you're going to land up in, should take some form of creative classes. Because I remember one of the first things I learned um, in primary school, in my after-school drama a club as it were was just to trust your voice the importance of your voice um, and of speaking up that it doesn't matter where you're from what you look like how much money you have that the fact that you are here in this time and you have a voice qualifies you enough already to speak um, no one is more important than you you are not no more important than someone else but you have a voice and you must use it and you can use it um, and, and that's a drama principle, trusting your voice. Another drama principle, tr trusting yourself. The idea of being able to just stop and listen to your inward processes. Um, that's a drama principle. That's something we should all be using in life. How do you listen to yourself? Do you even, do you speak your own language? Because many times the world and what we watch, we've got adverts, we've got TV, we've got social media, we've got phones, we've got all these things coming, constantly telling us things. And, yeah, and that's a lot of voices that like just clogs up space in your head. And with all those voices, do you recognize your own voice? Do you stop and take the time to hear your own voice? To be like, okay, yes, all these things are saying, are coming at me, but what, what do I think? What's my opinion? What's my voice? What's my spirit telling me? And again, that's a drama principle, the idea of trusting in self, right? Another drama principle, collaboration, respecting other people. We learn that in drama, the fact that we don't say lines just so that I'm waiting for Sam to stop speaking so I can say my line. No, we respond right? It's, we react and respond to other people, but you listen to hear. You don't listen to speak. That's a drama principle. That's a life principle. These are all principles we should be having. And so I can go on and on <laughs> about drama in, in school. So I really do believe in the importance of it and just the principles that we get that really can just be easily used in life in all forms. Okay. Sorry, just to add with what you're saying about, you know, the expressive arts being taught in schools. Let's say now I'm a learner in high school. I have passion for this thing. I want to do this thing. But, you know, as a filmmaker yourself, why do you, what, what do you think makes it so difficult for South African content, South African produced content to find its way to an everyday person? For example, I'm thinking about now national TV, where you'd see they'd rather play repeats from a movie that was made in 1977, some Kung Fu movie made in 1977, or they would rather show uh, 
I don't know, Rush Hour 1, Rush Hour 2, all those old <laughs> movies, American movies or Chinese movies, instead of showing content that is being produced in South Africa. Why is it so difficult for that to happen? I'm seeing Mildred's head like shaking, like, yo, she's like, she agrees with you. <laughs> so deep. Um, also, for those whose cameras aren't on, it would be lovely to see your face. Yes. I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, no pressure, but just, just <laughs> saying. Um, yes. Tonolo, I think that's a very like, multi-layered question. And I think there, there are many issues. Um, so I'll, I'll tackle it in two parts. Uh, the one part I'd say is, so if you look at our national broadcaster, we've all seen the news and heard about all the corruption and the money wasting. And a lot of these things cost money. And so if you think about the, old, the older um, films that you're mentioning or the older contents from overseas that they keep playing, those are things that are probably more affordable. It's, it's cheaper to buy something older uh, compared to buying the latest film and getting the rights to show that on the national broadcaster super expensive and we already know that our national broadcaster doesn't have money um so that's one thing um on the flip side in terms of local content i definitely feel like we are on the rise we've been in the season of seeing more exciting um local content coming onto our screens from made for tv movies to just regular films that eventually land up on tv to all the different telenovelas that we're seeing um on the different channels now. So we're definitely growing. And I think, again, it's also been a process of learning to trust our own voices as South African creatives, um, also learning to move past the apartheid narrative, because I think for a long time, we're very much stuck in that. And that's not to say that we're done with those stories, but also just finding more interesting ways of looking at that and looking at how that history of ours is now affecting us now and how do we then put that in story form? So that's one part of your question. But as for, you're saying someone in school, um, yes, big picture, long-term, aim for TV or film or whatever in terms of like a national or international scope. But again, you have to start with where you are. So start, with, start within your school, start within your peers, start creating there first. Practice using your voice there first. Collaboration is such a big word. Don't try to do everything by yourself. Tyler Perry is an exception. Do not look to him <laughs> as the way to move forward. Nothing against him. Bless you, Tyler Perry. I agree. But collaboration is key. So if you know that you are good at writing, then boy, girl, you write, you write like a crazy person. You find your dramatic extra friends who you know can act, grab them, collaborate, do something together. Social media has literally made the big world really small. You can reach anybody. And so even though you might be like, well, I'm only 16, I'm only 17, and this is my very much niche um, subject matter that I'm into, there's another 15, 16, 17 year old on the other side of the world who probably absolutely loves what you love as well. And they're possibly waiting for someone just like them to make the thing that you've been sitting on for so long. So don't doubt where you are. Don't, you know, discount yourself. Is that a word, discount yourself? Yeah. I'm breaking, I'm breaking my English, um, but you get oh, me. I, yeah, you, <laughs> you get you. You got me, <laughs> um, but just, Create where you are and your school environment, like your, the amount of people that you have in your school environment that you don't know where these people are going to land up, but it's already such a big network for you. And for all you know, that random boy from math class that you made a random, I don't know, radio drama that you started sharing on WhatsApp to all your friends lands up later on in life being some CEO somewhere that's going to fund you later when you're doing something. You never know who's in your circle. Absolutely. You never know. Can I just add to, to what you just said now, but you never know it. who you are, you know, meeting. Uh, I have a mentor who was a mess teacher for the longest time. He taught us the same students. And he taught the king of the Royal Buffalo King. And later in his life, he was employed by the same king of the Royal Buffalo King who he taught in school. So what you're saying resonated with me so much. So thank you very much for that. My pleasure. And then that's also exactly why you film, um, formed Rufifi Productions, right? Rufifi Pictures. So that Rufifi you could create amazing local content, right? 
Correct. So we, um, when we started with that, people as a company, so it's three of us, it's myself, it's Akina Motosa and Robbie Thorpe, um, just decided that we had very specific stories that we wanted to tell. We didn't necessarily want to always be responding to commissions where people are telling you what type of stories they need or whatever, but we wanted to work on just narratives that we wanted to tell. And so we formed this production company um, and did that. And the first thing we did uh, was a short film called The Call um, that then went around to different festivals and garnered like awards for that director. Um, and then we went on and did other stories that we wanted to tell. So yes, again, coming back to the idea of trusting your voice, trusting the stories that you want to tell um, and just going forth and doing it. I saw, I watched The Color of, of Wine. Yes. I watched it this morning because we'd been speaking about it. And um, I think you nailed it. That was the most, it was moving to me to watch. And I think more than anything, it's like you managed to tell the story in a way that showed these people to be heroes, essentially, to overcome really difficult odds and to step into their own power. And at the end of the day, that's what, that's what enables people to feel uplifted, right? That you can mm. actually watch a documentary, identify and feel like, well, if they can do it, I can, you know? Indeed. Yeah. So you managed, you nailed that. I think we've gotten to the point now where we would love it if you could share one of your poems. Are you ready? Do you need water? Do you need something to drink? <laughs> because you go, babe, whatever, whatever poem it is that you would like to share, um, we would love it. So I have a couple, um, but considering the fact that we've been speaking about our voices and the importance of using your voice, um, I'm going to read this next one. Um, and just to give you a bit of context about this, I wrote this. Um, I'm the type of person who gets angry tears. Um, and many times people might perceive that as weakness because you're, you're angry, but you're crying. So that must mean that you're weak, but no, I'm angry. And it's either the tears are going to come out my face or my fist is going to come towards your face. You want, you, we're nonviolent people. <laughs> so we'll go with the tears. And so in that moment of being upset and of trying to speak, um, this poem just, I guess, came through me and I wrote it in that moment just to remind myself of the importance of my voice. And so I will read this to you now to remind you of the importance of your voice. So here we go. It's very short. Mm -hmm. Say it with your voice shaking. Say it with tears streaming down your face and your heart and your throat. Say it with your hands and a fist and your knees buckling beneath you. Say it with no air, no breathing, eyes watery and head reeling. Say it unsure of the words, but certain of the feeling. Say it seething. Say it raging, body vibrating higher than the sun. Say it soft, say it loud, say it anyhow. Make them hear you now. Make them see you. Say it now. Say it now. Say it now. Some things don't need Need you to be polite rage girl let them know that you'll put up a fight you always do this to me <laughs> yeah. always, look she does this to me as she starts i'm like i don't know what it is about you but you're just oh sam i mean <laughs> we love you and your tears does anyone want to say something about that i see Good people Lord. excited i think donald do you want to jump on brother Donald, unmute your mic. Hi, how are you guys? <laughs> good, Donald. How are you doing? Hi. I'm great. I can tell you that was that was that was fantastic. Um, like wow, wow, wow. That was really great. And you know, like say it with your voice. Definitely, definitely. I, I really, I really got inspired there. Unfortunately, I'm gonna really cry like Sam, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Wow. As you start, I don't know what it is about you. I think it's the truth with which you speak. You know, yeah, you, you, you speak from such a truthful, honest, open, raw space. And, and like you say, sometimes, you know, being vulnerable doesn't mean you are weak. No, not at all. Vulnerability has right. always been a sign of strength. Such right. Strength. And also tears have always been a, a sign of life. So think about it. When you come into this world and you're born, what's the first thing you do? You, you cry. And when you're crying, people aren't freaking out that the baby's crying. People celebrate. People freak out when the baby's not crying. Why? Because tears and crying have always been a sign of life. 
and of strength and that you're drawing lung, like air into your lungs, right? So we're not against vulnerability. We're not against tears. If you're crying, baby, it means you're alive, you're breathing, you're still here, you've still got a chance. Keep going. Beautiful. Got now, I, let me just uh, connect this with our first webinar. Uh, for some of you guys that were part of the first webinar, you remember I shared uh, two videos. They didn't play properly. One, it was of Malala Yusuf Zai, and then also one of Kanye West, right? And we said that tears, it's, it's okay to cry. Sam said that, you know, he, she shared an example of Barack Obama giving a speech. She was emotional about it, but she was also keeping a balance. You know, he was keeping himself in check. You know, this is something that uh, uh, we can learn from, I think, your poem. It's just so spot on and also co connects very well with what we said the last time. Thank you. Yes. Great. Yes. I'm glad. <laughs> totally. Does anyone have a poem that they would like to share? Donald. Yes. Yes, Katla, who looks like you have a poem, share it with us. <laughs> Whoever has a poem, we would love to hear it. If you've got something to share, please do. This is, you've got our ears. Go, Kat. <laughs> okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read one of my poems. <clears throat> uh, uh, Sam, having worked with me, you've had this poem, but I love it so much. I think it's one of my favorite poems. Um, it's called At Your Mercy. And as you can tell, you'll tell through the poem what I was talking about. You know, it's, so it's, uh, At Your Mercy is where I lay, dancing to your tune as you play. It could be Lucifer's lullaby, but if it's you playing, I will say. At Your Mercy is where my ascent becomes a descent. I am so crazy that I trip and fall, but I don't cry a fall because I am fooled. An overflow of love like a fountain and a destination is only you. No detour, there's only one direction for this osmosis. My beautiful African queen, you are my oasis. You are my sunshine at day and my moon at night. And yes, I am just a squire and not a knight, but your favor upon me elevates me beyond the Lord Commander. Bulldozing over, free, bulldozing over everything with flames in my hand like Nazi the Salamander. At your mercy, I sound bold and tough, but you are like Brian of tough. Only your gentle and modulated voice makes it hard not to oblige when words begin to flow out your mouth and flow towards my ear, leaving me at your mercy, where my resolve is torn, hoping your heart I have won by laying at your mercy. At your mercy, I leave my neck stuck out, close my eyes and sing love songs waiting for your blade to make contact with my neck as it swings, separate my head from this body that's holding me back. At your mercy, Comatose I lay, never want to pray, so put I stay. Lose a chunk of me like hey, said I like to. We've lost him. Momentarily. At your mercy, I came whole and like a hollow. Sorry. So at your mercy, I came whole. At your mercy, I left the hole through my chest like a hollow. And if I was to do it again, I would follow. You know, through my heart sticks this arrow. No shooter inside, it's my hand that did it by leaping over common sense straight to your mercy. Ah, thank you guys, that's it. It's called At Your Mercy, one of my favorite poems. You can tell what it's about. <laughs> oh, ladies. So with guidance from Retavili, what would you say to help Tanola take that further? What did you get from that? Just because you are the expert here. Yeah. Well, but see, but that's the beautiful thing. I'm not. <laughs> Art is so gorgeously subjective and poetry, if anything, is the most subjective of them all, right? So, Tanola, I don't know what your journey has been with this specific poem. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how many times you've written and rewritten and edited, but also oftentimes it's also about trusting your gut. Um, so you know if it's done or not. I can't say. I don't mm -hmm. know. It, it didn't come out of me, it came out of you, you know. Um, and you also know what you wanna do with it. So if that still small voice inside of you has been speaking, and perhaps maybe this time you've been listening, or maybe you haven't, it, now it's time to you know, turn on your ears and listen, you'll know what to do with it next. Beautiful. Donald, would you love to share your poem? Donald? 
Donald. <laughs> hey, hi, hey guys. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't know what's going on with my phone, but I think it's sorted now. Um, okay. So it's just going to be very short and um, titled A Woman. She's like a surface of glass, transparent that you can see inside. The more you wipe it gently, the more it will shine. And you can see your reflection on it. As if the woman is preserving your image inside of her. If you break it, it will be so hard for you to collect if such a things again. If you did collect them to stick them, it won't be back to the way it was. It will always be the stick. Every time you pass your hand on the fracture zones and all the scars, you will hurt your hand. Women are precious. Thank you very much, Donald. That was so beautiful. I'm not sure if everybody heard you, bro. That was so good. That was so beautiful. Amazing. Thank you. And Thank just you for much. somebody who does not know, Donald is quite passionate about, uh, uh, you know, voicing uh, about the struggles that women go through, you know, gender-based violence. And now he's talking about celebrating a woman, you know. So th thanks for that, Donald. Yeah, which is a great one, besides the fact that it's Women's Month. But two, I think oftentimes we keep hearing mostly women's voices, right? Speaking to this as if this is a problem that women are going through by themselves. So uh, well done, Donald, as a young man, um, throwing your voice into the ring because we definitely need more male voices in this space. So we thank do. you. And Donald is like he, every, ever since I've met him, he's been writing about these issues. It seems to be the most passionate thing about him is writing about women and, and praising and revering them. And for me, that's why I thought he had to be here today to meet you and to be in your presence and learn from you and for you to hear him as well. So thank you so much, Donald. Appreciate it. And then, pleasure. thank you. Does anyone else have something before we go back to Retabili for another poem? Can I ask a question. I'm clearly not a poet. Um, but will you guys share your poems in writing? I mean, I'd like to read them. I, I, I lose a little bit in, in hearing of the delivery and with the bad lines and the bad stutter. And I think sometimes it's nice just to dwell on the words of the, of, of, of the poem. So maybe if each of you will send Pam, I mean Sam, Please. Sam with a P. If you send sure. Pam writing and we can then just share it because maybe where, where it's broken down, um, that would be great. Yes, and there's, there can be discussion around it. You're absolutely right. And unpack certain mm -hmm. ideas and that would be a great way to engage. Also, a great teaching tool to see how other people write and structure poetry, right? Because we all do it in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like we all write an iambic pentameter, which at some point was the only way to do it. And yet here we are discovering our own ways of how to structure our own words and thoughts. So I think that's a great idea, Clifford. Great. Carry on. Thanks, Clifford. Please, Reta Bihili, please. One more, two more, five more. <laughs> um, how much time do we have? Cause I can we've got time, up. baby. We've got, we've got time for one of your big old ones. <laughs> A bigger one. So a Sam, um, one. <laughs> so you know the, Sam, you know the Women's Day one Please. that I did. So I have that Please. as an option. Please do that um, one. Alternatively, I have another one that's more on just the power of words and what's in a name. So Sam, the choice is yours. Maybe we want both. Go ahead. Oh we boy. want both. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we would be paying good money to see her normally, guys. So you are very, very, very blessed. I feel blessed. I'm anointed by you, your presence, and your words. Bless you, Sam. Okay, so I'll do, I'll do them both with a, a, a gap in between. Um, so context, since I love to contextualize things. Uh, this was written, um, I was invited to an all-girls school a couple of years ago to speak to just, it was like a girls, a mother daughter event and just about just the importance of finding power in your femininity, but also there was a lot of bullying happening in the school and name calling and it was ugly. And so the idea is they had me, I came, I gave a talk and then I also said a poem just about the power of names and what we choose to answer to. And so that's the context of this poem. 
Here we go. What's in a name? Name, spelling, N-A-M-E. Dictionary definition, a word or combinations of words by which a person or thing is known, addressed, or referred to. Name, retavile definition, a word or combination of words by which a person is known, addressed, or referred to that speaks to their inner being and draws out their true essence. The first female name, Eve, spelling E V E. Definition, life or life-giving or the mother of all who have life. Her purpose and essence clear, give and be life. What's in a name? We've been created by the creator to create. He spoke and life sprang forth, created in his image, filled with his power. I too will speak life against the grain of the earth that shouts what it thinks I am. I shall carve myself a new name that I will carry without shame. What's in a name? What will my names be? What will I answer to? What words will I allow to shape who I am? The answer is up to me. My name is wise for knowledge comes and goes but wisdom stands through the ages my name is faith for when my heart is low my hope is set on the most high my name is spirit led for i know that i don't journey this life alone my name is fearless for greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world my name is beautiful for i am fearfully and wonderfully made my name is leader because i have been positioned as the head and not the tail my name is daughter for i'm a child of god my name is royal for i'm a princess of a king what is in a name and now i ask you what do you call yourself what will you answer to it's more than words we speak and syllables we utter. It's life and death. It's what we'll live up to. There's so much in a name and so much more in you. There's so much in a name. So be careful what you choose, what's in your name. It's the cadence that you use. Can you hear it, guys? Can you hear the rhythm? Can you hear where she stresses words? Can you hear where she takes a pause? Can you hear just the rhythm of it that leads you? It sort of takes you from the start and it pushes you with this amazing tension that pushes you and pulls you and steps forward and back. And then eventually it takes you to this absolute high point before she gently drops you at the end of it. And you feel like you are connected and pulled along. You are walking the journey with her. Absolutely, you are taking you are taking us through a journey with the, your poems here, you know. And I'd just like to connect it once again to what we are trying to achieve with the Dare to Dream and the President for a Day. You know, you are your speech is taking us through a journey. Uh, your performance piece will be taking us through a journey, and you know, it's it's just beautiful seeing how you can do that. You can pretty much make us go wherever you want us to go. You know, just as the retable is doing, retable is taking you to the mountain top, and then before you know it, you are you know free falling from you know the peak of the mountain and you're going down. It's just so beautiful how you do that. I think we are all learning so much here, retable. We are all learning so much here from you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to hear that. But again, I am not special, and just like I have certain stories that exist within me that come through my pen, you have everybody has a story within them. We all have stories. It's just about how we get them out of us and we all have our own styles and our own way of writing and our own way of connecting with words. Um, and so just to encourage anybody, if you are feeling some type of way, if you're feeling like, well, I can't do what she did, that's, that's perfect. <laughs> that's great. You don't need to do it like how I do it because that's me. And you have your own unique voice that people need to hear and see um, as well. So just to encourage you with that. 100%, only one of us. And everyone is unique and everyone has a voice and a purpose and a reason for being here and something to say, like you said. Indeed. Yeah. Awesome. So Are you I've got okay, one Lizzie? more. <laughs> Girl, you could go on. I know this one is my favorite. I'm throwing my shoe at you. <laughs> <laughs> And now she's going to have me in floods of tears. I'm just warning you. I would love everyone as well at the end, at some point, if you're able to just comment and have some sort of sense of reaction to what these poems have meant to you. But or anyway. even in the chat. I, I also know that people do get scared 
to yeah. speak with people that you don't know. Uh, uh, an online room full of strangers. So if you're comfortable texting, <laughs> feel free to text in the chat. Um, this next poem I wrote in 2016, um, and it's one that stays relevant to this day. Um, I wrote it after a friend went through gender-based violence, um, and then another friend went through gender-based violence, and I walked that road with them. And then I went through my own journey of experiencing gender-based violence as well. And so I often, I some, some poems sometimes write you. So I was very against um, wanting to write anything about it because, you know, you, you just you don't want to deal, right? You want to run away and forget anything happened. Um, and this poem found me late on a Friday night. I literally woke up grabbed a pen and wrote it. And it's, I think it's the only poem I've ever written that's only been done in one draft, one and done. I didn't touch it again. Um, I always say that this poem wrote me. And so I will share this with you now. It's titled Fire Women. Our bodies are fires always close to explosion. The world is a cold place and everybody wants a bit of warmth. They think they can get it from me, from us, from we women. A hot thing in a cold place made up of parts to be taken apart and asset to the entitled mentality caught in looking at us in quantity like wares to be bought and sold and used and thrown out because we're sullied and soiled because of what happened to us, in us, on us, with us, with you, man. Because in your eyes, post our time, being with you has made us less than man, oh man, as if we had a choice. Forgetting we had no say in the matter, because when it comes to what matters, when our voices rage loud and our bodies burn high, praying to burn away your bodies on top of ours, our matter doesn't matter because all that matters is you. Your pleasure, your want, your desire, your meeting, your end in me, in we, in us, thus resulting in the end of me, of us, caught underneath. No air for the flame to breathe, confused, because we don't know what else we can be. All we know is fire, it's all we know to be, but in this world we're seeing flames for just being who we be. Our flames, once fanned and high, are snuffed out early. From blue hot heat to gray cold and ashy, this isn't what we're called to be. This isn't how it should be. Our bodies are fires always close to explosion. We explode out of anger. We explode out of hurt. We explode to protect each other. Don't you dare come close. Some of us are raging fires, but our touch has turned cold. Too many street commands of smile, baby have frozen our faces into a scowl that we permanently hold only in places of safety. Amongst those we hold dear, do you see these flames thaw growing bigger and bigger as we pull back our fear? In these fireplaces you will witness flames dance, free to be and do whatever because no threat exists here. The freedom of firewomen sharing their light and warmth with whomever comes near. But the world is teaching us otherwise. The world is a dynamic place, constantly shifting, twisting, and turning, putting firewomen in their place where you thought you're safe. You're not those you thought you could trust. You can't. So best keep your flame small, girl. Keep it enclosed and tucked away. You wouldn't want to attract attention now. Want to keep out of harm's way. But world. You must know that our bodies are fires on the verge of explosion because why else would you fight to keep us so small? Our bodies are fires that will raise a commotion because our lives will no longer be lived your way. Our bodies are fires that will burn up the ocean that you keep sending to wash us away. Our bodies are fires that will rage against the notion that our bodies are yours and not our own. Our bodies are fires that will rise and burn together because we know that we're brighter that way. Our bodies are fires and now we're exploding, burning wild, burning free, fire women claiming space and patriarchal territory, incinerating the misogynistic hegemony. Our bodies are fires and now we're exploding, ablaze no longer will we sit and stay. Our bodies are wildfires and we have exploded. Be part of the change or get out of our way. 
Arigato. <clears throat> you okay, Sam? <laughs> so I, I've got two questions. Hmm. Sorry. Firstly, how do you, you've gone from one poem to another to another. Yes. How do you remember the words? Do you visualize, can you, can you see in front of you? The line is breaking. I don't know if it's me. How did Flip it. Can you yes. hear me now? Like Clifford has a problem with this line. Oh dear. Okay, we can hear you now. Go, Cliff. <laughs> Go for it. I was asking, how do you recall and remember the words in the moment? Do you visualize it? Do you, can you see it in front of you? Um, because uh, you switched from three different poems and you've just got into that poem and it's just flown. I think it, it takes practice, for one. I definitely do practice and do it a lot by myself. Um, but I go on the journey like I'd expect my audience to go on the journey. So I know that I write visually and each stanza has its own story and journey. And so I see it, I do visualize, but obviously you do have the road literally sitting, reading, saying it over and over again to yourself. But I also, I, I see the story. I, I see it happening in front of me and that what helps me to recall. It's almost like was my other question is whether you write it is whether you write visually, you, you know, when when you put those words to paper, are you hearing the rhythm as you're writing? Because I imagine there's the written word and the way you speak it with the rhythm is, is very different. Agreed. So um, having been part of the poetry scene in Joburg for so long, um, there was a big movement that happened cheapers many years ago, I think I was still in Vasti. So 2000 and between 2007 till about 2010, where the Joburg poetry scene was shifting from people reading their poetry in their hands and um, in their notes or their phones to being um, spoken word. And we, we, a shift happened into spoken word poetry, which is very different. So oftentimes I feel that when people read my poetry, it's not as impactful compared to when I'm speaking it because I write to speak. I don't write to be read. I don't think I'd, my poetry would necessarily work in a chapbook. It works maybe if I were to, so something I've been toying with is of releasing like an, an audio book of sorts or like a visual album where you can see the images and hear my voice because I don't write to be written, um, if that makes sense. Totally. And also there is that beautiful performance aspect of it, which is where you come from, essentially. You've studied Exactly. Drama. Started so, as a performer. Started as a performer. And Clifford, also in terms of scripts or even delivering monologues, these are part of your, this is part of your training. And your mind just does. It does kind of remember the story because you've linked it in your own mind. And, and when you, it's the same as when you're playing a character. You know what the intention is behind what you're saying and where you're trying to go to. And so that kind of like embeds itself, like you mentioned, in you. Somehow mm. it settles in you. And then it sort of comes out quite naturally. But, but only if you commit to it. If you find yourself not committed 100%, and this is what I notice about you as well, is that from the minute you start, and this is what I've always wanted to say to kids, um, when you imagine that the light goes, okay, you're on. This is where I start. And from the minute I start, I'm in performance mode. So your presence and your full being is committed to that moment as the lights come on, essentially. Mm. And then in the entire way through, it's like you are present in the moment, in each moment, and your presence comes through that. Do you know what I mean? And then as soon as Definitely. it's finished, lights go down and the performance is done and you go from performance mode back to self. It's incredible, but it is just a journey. And it is something that most people do learn to do, but you're incredible that you've done it in this pla platform with no backstage, nothing to prepare yourself just instantly like that. Thank you, Sam. Beautiful. Can I ask, do we have uh, questions from the floor for the title? Yes, yes, yes I've got one. I don't know yes, if you guys can hear me. We can. Yes. Uh, I don't know. Uh, with, with poetry, 
And like, I mean, I, I'm not a vocal person, but when I go through something, I find comfort in writing it down. You understand? So is it considered uh, poetry? All the, all, all the things that I've written, I've got a whole diary of, of, of my emotions. For instance, my father passed away last year, two days before Christmas, and I wrote something, but I haven't spoken about it or I haven't told, I haven't shared that piece with anyone. Is it, is, is it considered a poetry or is it something that I just wrote at that moment? What defines a, a, a piece? Or, I'm not sure if I'm making sense. No, definitely, you are. Mm. Um, mm. I think there's always a delicate line, I guess, that needs to be walked when writing and creating. Um, mm. Because obviously, naturally, as creatives, we bring ourselves, right? We bring us, our work is ourselves. We work from heart, we work from inside out, and we just pour so much of ourselves into work. And there's always a great element of vulnerability in what we do. And obviously, condolences about the loss of your dad, that was something very personal and very close, right, that you've written. And so I always say, I think, two things when this comes up. Um, one, only share when you're ready, um, because once something is out, it's out. There's no taking it back. We can't take words back. Um, and so know that part of your mourning process and part of your process of dealing was writing and journaling and however that prose came out, that was part of your process. And maybe that might be private for now um, because it's still part of your process and you're still going through your mourning process. But perhaps later when your heart is in a bit of a stronger place, your mind is in a bit of a stronger place, when you review what you've written, you might be able to see, well, I've dealt with this and actually this is powerful and actually perhaps this could help someone else who's in a similar position to me and so maybe with a couple of rewrites and edits maybe removing some of the things that are too delicate or too personal to share you can have something that you can share and that you'll be ready to share uh, but there's always a very strong line between oversharing as artists where people are like well this is a thing i don't know why he thinks we need a <laughs> We need a lesson of this <laughs> compared to this is universal and this is something that actually can still speak life into other people and other people will find strength from it because actually I'm not the first person to go through this. I'm not the last person to go through this. And perhaps your pain will be able to help someone go through their pain. So don't discount what you've written. Um, don't, it's a, I, I definitely, by the sounds of it, it sounds like you journal you journal, journaling is your process. It's very similar to mine. Um, and somewhere in there is poetry and prose, but also just like your thoughts and your feelings, because sometimes you just need to get them out of you and put them on the page. Um, but take the time and when you're ready, you'll review and I, you will know. Just don't let your ego get in the way, but you'll know. I think um, no, that's, it's beautiful what you've actually mentioned because um, if you, um, there is a book called The Artist's Way. Do you know it? It's, it's written by Julia Cameron. And she actually, you very instinctively have, have journaled as a way of getting to know your feelings. Because she advocates to um, wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is just to write a free flow of words for three pages. And the concept behind that is for the first sort of page and a half, you're just writing about what's on your brain, sort of like well, what happens. Like what I have to do today, what I'm worried about, what I'm worried about, what I'm worried about, what I'm worried about, what I'm worried about. and then eventually halfway through you get to the point where you start to get deeper and you start to connect with what's really going on. Shut up, Christine. And so she sees this magical way of getting to yourself, of connecting to your creative self um, and to just realize, I mean, that's very instinctive of you to actually write your feelings creatively it's like it's it's and especially people who've ever had writer's block she talks about just do that wake up in the morning and don't expect anything just write just write just write just write free flow of stuff and amazingly stuff automatically comes out suddenly in a way that you think did i write that i think mm. like what you say you know did i write that or did that write me mm. did that come through me did i get out of the way and suddenly the words came and and i connected to my feelings absolutely um we have another question from Musa, Musa Kumalu. Hello, hello, how are you? 
good how are you musa i'm good i'm good i'm good so i am mr kumalo from kenilworth secondary so i just got a question to ritabile so ritabile my question is going to be mainly based uh, to the classroom context right so i'm just going to give you sure. a scenario and i would love for you to uh, maybe respond to that so i'm a grade eight teacher and i'm definitely sure that i've got poets in my classrooms so uh if you were in grade eight right now and you knew what you knew how would you want me as a teacher to support you and the reason why i ask that is because i'm a grade eight english teacher i have to stick to the curriculum i need to cover content but in me covering the content i also want to touch on to your dreams your hopes and aspirations of becoming a writer of becoming a poet i don't want to shut that down so mm. how would you want me to support you if you were an eighth grade grade eight student and know, and you knew what you knew right now that's a great question um i also love the fact that you care enough for your kids to be here and asking that so already um salute you um because really teachers change the world and i really don't believe that you get enough credit at all because teachers literally changed my life um knowing what i know now thinking of the classroom context I think there are there are a number of things you could do from I guess including some drama techniques in how you teach to know if you do know you have these poets to instead of yes you're covering the content but giving them creative outlets um and how they respond to some of the projects you give so I know that sometimes back when I was school I was in school um I wasn't crazy about writing the essays and mine was an Afrikaans teacher who taught in drama but then he would give us other outlets to still do to still do the um project but in a drama way so we then wrote like drama plays or then I wrote a response to Anki Kroch's poem but then I had to write my own Afrikaans poem so it was still within the syllabus and what he was teaching but we were given the space to respond a bit more creatively than just the typical way that things are normally done um but also Musa the simple act of having a conversation with your students letting them know that you see them that you see this gift in them that you're open to reading their stuff um and giving feedback if they'd like it or just as a space to share already is massive because many times kids don't have this the space they don't have another elderly voice affirming them and telling them that their writing matters that their voice matters that their presence matters um and so already you just identifying and acknowledging that and opening yourself up to them sharing and letting them know that you are a space that they can come to to share massive big game changer big game changer absolutely and musa you know this is a conversation i normally have with sam quite a lot a lot of teachers are uninspired you know because of this curriculum and all that and the fact that you care about your kids that deeply uh, i am humbled and honored to know that we have teachers like you still and as the retabile said teachers change the world and you guys don't get enough credit for that so thank you so much musa if if i can add musa i also think it was an excellent question and just to share with you some of our experiences is once we started on this route of giving the kids a platform for the performing arts and the public speaking is we saw kids stepping up once the spotlight was on them and their talent was being recognized is they go on the journey themselves we found kids you know doing public speeches to each other we found dance teams you, you know dancing off against each other and maybe you can launch a little poetry slam group you, you know and and this online stage can be that platform where you can encourage your kids to write the poetry to present to each other to film each other and bring it onto this online stage i think the idea that this becomes a platform for sharing so as much as uh, sam and tonolo has made this an open mic the idea equally is to get the kids to film video so they learning technique which is about video and production and they can polish their acts and they can bring it to this platform to share mm -hmm. it with their peers so you can unlock that and you may find that they've got the energy and the drive to run with it alone and all you are is the catalyst and the coach and the initiator but uh you know i think it was a great question and 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 we really are pleased that there are teachers like you out there who who are seeing 
that we've got to go beyond the curriculum to find the kids. Yeah. Uh, and to yes, add to what yes, people yes. are saying, um, I can see we have teachers here. Can I just, you know, just a plea to the teachers. Can you please, uh, you know, tell your, your learners about these online stage uh, webinars? Because this is for them, you know, and as far as I'm concerned, sorry, as far as I can understand Clifford, there's, um, they all have hotspots, right? The schools, the five schools that you guys are working with have hotspots. So teachers, please just tell your learners about these hotspots so that they can maybe stay a bit longer after school to be able to be part of the webinars because this is for them and there's so much uh, information here. I feel like as much as we are learning, the learners have more to benefit from this. So teachers, please, please just continue to remind the learners about this. If you have us on, 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 on if you are part of the group on WhatsApp, please Sam and I will continue communicating with you guys uh, via WhatsApp as well as Bronwyn. So teachers, please, Musa, tell your kids, it would be lovely, it would be awesome to have them here. No, thank you very much. We will definitely do that. I think uh, I think if had my kids been here, uh, they would have definitely, you know, gained a lot of confidence, especially the way Ritabili was presenting. It was beautiful, you know. And the, the reason why I, I, I mentioned content is because, you know, it's only in spaces such as these when, uh, when Ritabili is reciting where learners are able to identify themselves within the particular poetry because yeah. the poetry that we find ourselves doing in the classroom it becomes boring because they're unable to relate to that. So, yeah, mm -hmm. so big ups to you, to you too, Ritabile. You know, we'll also try at Kenilworth to make sure that we create these spaces that, you know, that learners are able to identify themselves within the poetry as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Just, just an advert for this program is these sessions are recorded. And I think Bronwyn will, will, will cut a version and it will be on the website. So, Musa, if you want to share it, you know, with your learners after the event or come back and look for it, you'll find uh, Ritabile Tabi's poetry. Um, so you'll find it. It hasn't disappeared into the ether forever, even though it was a live performance. Um, I don't know if she was told uh, that we were recording it, but maybe it's time to disclose it. And, uh, Good to know. <laughs> and, get a, and, get a release, and get a release so that some of these kids can watch it uh, after the event. Uh, don't worry, Cliff, I'll send you my bill. Yes, you will. <laughs> I want to also just say that ordinarily when you're working with, when you're managing to work face to face with learners, there is an engagement that um, automatically happens. And, and obviously it can be a little bit scary and daunting online, but Clifford, you're absolutely right that we can create a safe space here. Mm. You know what I mean? That this is a safe space where there's no judgment. It really is about the journey as much as we're wanting to have some sort of, um, you know, show at the end of this or a competition or finalize pieces. This is the place also to dip your toe in the water and to, to not feel overwhelmed by the bigness of what it is you've got to deliver and see it more as a safe space to express yourself, to try, to experiment, to share, to, to, to discuss, to, to get feedback from, to make yourself feel better. And in, in, in some way, over this time, especially when so much anxiety is out there and it's so difficult for teachers and for learners that this might become a space where actually this is where you get to vent. This is where mm -hmm. you get to, to feel like oh, a bit of light relief. You know, it's like your family. This is your safe space right here. If we could create that kind of community, that's what I would like to do. Yes. Yeah, a, a space for brave vulnerability because mm -hmm. vulnerability takes courage. Um, agreed. Agreed. The, 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 the one nice thing about doing it on this space is you may never see these people again. <laughs> if, if you perform in front of your classmates in the classroom, you've got to see them tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> this you know. Thank you guys so much for today. Reta Billy, you are, you continue to amaze me, inspire me. Really, I love you. The very essence of you. I love from the soul in me to the soul in you. I love you. Thank you, everyone. I receive. Us. I would Thank love you. to, Sam, um, just before you go, I have this little piece of paper here that sits on my computer, um, which I'd love to read to you. Um, so I, I'm sure you read in my bio, I'm, one of, I'm the artistic director for a scholarship program. So once a year, I get to be a teacher for two weeks. <laughs> um, yes. And so this is normally something I read to my students before they go on stage um, and they all get like a little laminated copy and so um, I'd like to just read it to you it's not I didn't write it it's not mine it's by Andrea Dworkin um, 
And again, just a reminder of the space that you're talking about and what you're wanting to do. I feel like it's an, an apt way to end. So she writes, does the sun ask itself, am I good enough? Am I worthwhile? Is there enough of me? No, it burns and shines. What does the moon think of me? Does the sun ask itself, what does the moon think of me? How does Mars feel about me today? No, it burns and shines. Does the sun ask itself, am I as big as the other suns and other galaxies? No, it burns, it shines. And so that's always just a reminder, just to burn and shine. You are your own galaxy. You, as you are yourself, are enough. And all you need to do is step up and burn and shine. Amen. What a beautiful way to end. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. And we hope to see you again next time and uh, continue to create this safe space. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.